Today we'll be exploring some proof of concept ideas in terms of origami and how it can be used in robotics as end effectors and certain other applications. So who am I and what are my qualifications? Yes, I can go on and list where I've worked in industry or some certifications that I have, but at the end of the day in the world of additive, I think the most important qualification is the amount of trial and error you have under your belt when it comes to printing parts, seeing how they fail and learning from all those fails. It helps you push kind of the limitations of additive itself, what you can improve and what you can and can't do. Going back to origami, what kind of relevance does origami have to Robotics. We can consider how compact and lightweight origami is depending on the material that you make it out of. The folds that you are able to create with origami structures can give you intricate movements and transformations using fewer parts than a traditional assembly and we can precisely control these origami folds creating deployable structures that are portable and easy to store. Why 3D printed origami? What we'd like to explore today is the accessible technology of additive and how we can precisely manufacture the complex shapes of origami using it. Highly customizable in pink and caps because that's essentially what additive lets us do is customize. It also offers rapid prototyping which we've definitely leveraged throughout all of our case studies in this presentation. Paper origami dates back to way before the 16th century. I think the first origin was a butterfly origami in a poem that dates way before like 1680. In the early 2000s, origami began to be explored in the world of robotics. Of course, 3D printed origami isn't new. It's almost difficult to do something completely new and additive now with the rate that everything is changing. Practical exploration began early 2016. And what I mean practical exploration, I mean specifically actually prototyping, manufacturing, testing. This is a pretty notable example where they called it the twister and they used this tower fold. They printed on a substrate creating soft hinges and it's able to bend around different geometries. I will cover a bit of terminology. We're going to start with compliant structures design that can deform elastically under applied forces and absorb energy. Isolated fold is another one and you'll see one of the case studies is a map fold that uses parallelograms and essentially it's just a pattern of series of the same shapes and so the one on the screen is a water bomb fold. Living hinges, you've seen them everywhere from the ketchup you used this morning on your eggs. The lid itself has a tiny piece of plastic that lets it open and close like this back and forth repeatedly. Repeatedly, that's a living hinge. In 3D printing, our designs are a little bit different than injection molding, obviously because of the voids and toolpath deviations. Kirigami is basically a deviation of origami. Instead of folds, you use cuts. Curfing or kerf bending is when you do a lot of continuous slits in your wood to allow it to bend. And then lamina emergent mechanisms, LEMs, they're a variation of compliant mechanisms, or we also call them pop-up structures. And they're fabricated from planar materials and they have a motion outside of their build plane, which technically the origami I've printed and I'm showing in this presentation would fall under an LEM. So the role of additive. In the video here, that's just a large scale mirror fold. I was able to print in pieces on my Prusa i3 MK3S Plus. All the printer names are such mouthfuls. They just get longer and longer. That's a large scale origami fold and we'll be looking into that later. AM allows us to fabricate complex geometries, just like I mentioned, the kerfing, the living hinges, and these LEMs instead of other strategies. It has a layer by layer approach, which is a pro because it can print relatively fast, but it is a con in the material extrusion sense where we have challenges from the voids and even the inner layer bonding strengths. When we're fully printing the origami, meaning I'm printing my living hinge and I'm printing my rigid elements, it becomes a challenge with how long I can bend it back and forth and back and forth. 3D printing origami is not new. A lot of people have done it directly on paper. Drew Bachelor, I believe it is, has an awesome blog where he's gone over several different folds using Rhino 6 Grasshopper to generate the 3D models, and they're quite beautiful. They just take forever to fold. You're printing on a piece of paper or felt, and like origami has mountain and valley folds. Those are things you have to coerce yourself through the paper, so you're basically doing the origami just as normal. In this presentation, we're looking at fully 3D printing it with directional channels in our origami, so it's a lot easier to collapse in on itself once it's been printed. My strategy is a multi-material extrusion using FDM, just exploring the proof of concept, some different folds, and all the design challenges behind it. So I used a dual print method using my Prusa. I have a flexible material that I print on the bottom called X920. It's actually a PLA and copolymer infused together. It has a 
natural hardness of A89. I've actually had a harder time printing with TPU because it is very shiny. Like the surface is very slippery when I print with it. When I have tried to layer a rigid material on top, it tends to peel off. I specifically chose two PLA based things, hoping that the fusion between the two when I print them on top of each other is a lot better than completely different materials. Planar slicing using Prusa Slicer and I printed it on a desktop machine, so you don't need any fancy equipment. This is where a lot of you in the audience will probably judge me. I did use Onshape for this. It is a free browser-based CAD. I am exploring other possibilities of basically generating the tessellation and the hinge geometry, so I'm not painstakingly sitting there and going three millimeters for each living hinge and then adding the channels. There's definitely better ways to do this. The pro is that it's accessible, it's easy to do, you don't need anything fancy to make the CAD model. The con is it takes forever, especially when you're doing larger scale ones like the bottom left. So let's learn from this frog. This is a little froggy I printed to kind of explore everything wrong and the challenges with trying to 3D print origami as a living hinge multi-material. Have to decide what fold you're going to do and which ones are going to be the peak or mountain folds and which ones are the valleys because that dictates the geometry you make in your CAD for those folds. I started by just taking the normal frog fold and making that in CAD and printing it. You can see in the bottom right under the video, the hinge kind of bulged. What I noticed was that with 3D printed origami, you almost don't need every single panel in your fold because it's redundant. And I need to consider how thick I make my final extrusion because that plays into a role how thick I make certain living hinges. So there's two ways I could have gone about this. First way was to cut off all the unnecessary panels, which I've done here, that are kind of redundant and make the frog overall slimmer and just easier to fold. Or where those folds are, that bulge, like right here, I could have doubled their thickness or the gap distance and that way it would have folded around all the subsequent pieces that kind of bent underneath. So there was a lot to learn from this frog. I have three case studies, this water bomb, I have a mirror fold as well as a BYU gripper and I have a few different hinges. So this one is the one I'd like to call the slot hinge. It's basically one where I cut out a hole and this one is bi-directional, so with the slot, it's easy to kind of fold the print off the build plate in both up and down mountain or valley directions. This one is great if you're building a tessellation where you don't know which way you're gonna fold something. You can use a slot hinge. Also, it takes less material. It is less springy, which, you know, as you would guess, if I have more material, it would be more springy on the folds because there's more surface area to work with. So how I started was with this water bomb fold, and the idea, it's just a small base fold. You'd be able to add a bunch in your CAD, tessellate it. I sliced it and you can see the two colors dictate my multi-material. So I have the bottom piece, which is the flex material and the rigid panels on top. And here I've highlighted one of the problems, which I'm sure a lot of you have guessed is all these voids. And so there's a few things I can do to avoid these, but at the end of the day, those cause problems in the performance of my part. That is most likely where I will begin to see failure points. If I use this as a gripper, if I use this to protect any kind of cable equipment on my robot, etc. With the folds that I've shown, all the testing has pretty much failed in the void areas. So there's this gripper as well at Brigham Young University has a lot of free CAD models also on Thingiverse related to their compliant mechanism research, but this is one of their grippers and I did start making it out of paper and that's how I figured out which one was a valley and which one was a mountain fold. And I kind of put a screenshot up here to show you that I used channels instead this time of slots. And these channels, I was able to basically tell my print if it was a valley or a mountain fold. So this one is a valley fold. It will coerce the origami to fold this way. This one is a mountain fold. The printer does not use support. It's bridging over this gap, which as you'd assume, when you make a larger gap distance, the bridging gets more challenging for the part. Trying to print with supports of a flexible material is pretty challenging, trying to remove it after. So this might end up becoming a three material print if you'd like to do like soluble, or if you need big gap distances, you wouldn't want to use a channel geometry for the bridging. And last but not least, we have this map fold. Again, we started with the origami fold itself knowing which ones are mountains and which ones are valleys. I did use the channel fold here as well. There are a lot of problems too with this toolpath zooming in. I don't know how well you'll be able to see in the top here. You can play around in your slicer with different raster angles which is great but it only works for about half of the hinges. The problem is because I have some oriented at a degree angle here and some oriented horizontal, my raster angle is only optimized if I hit 90 degrees for these ones here. When I'm bridging, I'd like to go straight over as a first pass just and 
in these diagonal ones, I'd also like to cross over, but because I'm using a traditional slicer and it's more of a solution, a one size fits all thing, my toolpaths that I'm generating are slightly customizable, but definitely not ideal for an LEM or something that is folding in different directions. For example, this Mira Ori fold, when I'm collapsing this, it's folding in within itself in along the folds, but then it's also expanding out the other way. That's also definitely a challenge with respect to your toolpaths. The origami itself is highly customizable. I have in this picture just the map fold with the parallelograms. These kind of things apply to any folds. I did publish a paper earlier this year with my advisor kind of exploring these different joints, but we categorize the customization into joint style, the size of your panels, and then the gap distance between those panels. And a few of the joint styles we've explored are channels, the slot ones, and then the strips. These strip ones and the slot ones, I would call them bi-directional, meaning by printing a flat geometry, you're able to coerce the origami fold to do both a mountain and a valley. And then the channel ones, you're basically printing the direction that your origami will fold. All right, so we're here to the design challenges and some possible solutions. As I've kind of highlighted before, the design challenges are your toolpath. So your toolpath creates voids in your part, which can lead to failure, especially if I'm using an origami fold to create a robot gripper. I don't want it to be, oh, 10 times and then it breaks. I want to create a lifelong part that is able to last for several cycles on the line or wherever it's being used. So one way to do that is to customize my toolpaths by, for example, in this photo, instead of having two walls, I can use a variable thickness to one large bead that goes around here and fills in my out and that gets rid of all these tiny triangular voids here. Another idea is to do ironing per layer, which as anyone who's ever ironed their clothes, by ironing every single layer, I would iron out every void, but as you guessed, that would take forever. This fold right here, that water bomb one right here, it's a six minute fold. If I iron every single layer, it's an hour and 16 minutes. So it's not extremely feasible if you're on a time crunch. Another problem is the binding between layers. I thought by using a PLA-based flex would actually stick together. I would print at a higher temperature on the first layer that was PLA on top, and it did bind very well, but after several iterations, a few panels fell off. There's a group doing digital materials where essentially they 3D print their own filament with different cores, so they have one filament in the core and then print it around the center with another filament, and if you have a material change printer, you could accomplish this. But the idea is exploring printing or creating your own filament where the core is your flex material and the other outside is the rigid material. So you have something like a functionally graded material or something that kind of has both the properties of the two filaments that you're printing together and you print it as like an inner layer so that the two other materials would bond a little bit better together. Of course, I have yet to try this. This would need further work. And above and beyond, material extrusion. What are other ways we can manufacture origami? Of course, silicone molding is tried and true, but it would require a lot more steps, molding, mixing, eliminating bubbles, and that's something I don't want to deal with. Essentially, bubbles would be creating the same problem as voids in my toolpath. Laser cutting is an option, and a lot of the origami and robotics parts use laser cutting, but again, it kind of defeats the purpose of fully 3D printing it. So the other solution I be open to exploring is choosing a 3D printing process that is more isotropic. And I know our previous presenter said, oh, when do you ever need something 3D printed that's isotropic in like every direction? Well, I mean, this is the case. We could explore VAT polymerization, but how do you resin print more than one material? Could you resin print the flex material and then create like a little jig where I only have the panels open and then UV cure everything but the hinges? That sounds like a wild process and then resin or can I use binder jetting or material jetting? Probably material jetting because you can do more than one material. So that would be future steps. Other than in robotics, there's a lot of different applications for this 3D printed origami, but as that's the topic of the presentation, let's start there. You can make highly customized grippers with this kind of process, create artificial muscles, as well as modular machine bellows for covering any kind of cables or keeping dust out of your systems. Other uses include as fabrics, you can make clothes, purses, things like that, prosthetics or even like modular casts, and then configurable meta materials. That is the conclusion of this presentation. I hope you learned something new. As I mentioned before, it is extremely proof of concept and it's a lot of where my trial and error has been coming from, trying different folds, seeing where they fail, how you can optimize them. Next on the line is the custom G coding so that I can actually Actually test some of these improved toolpath ideas. And last but not least, I have a select amount of origami business cards that I made in case anyone is curious, would like to take a little bit with them home. And if 
I run out, you can always check out the video I made about how I modeled and printed them for some design tips and beyond. Do we have any questions? Questions? Sorry, I was a little bit late to the presentation and um, from what I caught, um, it sounds like you've been prototyping mostly in FDM um, and you're further going to try more isotropic methods. Um, um, I would also recommend um, maybe SLS, um, TPU um, being a really good material for SLS and getting that sort of properties uh, of a really resilient material that doesn't delaminate, which can happen with TPU sometimes overuse if you print it with an FDM machine. Um, uh, sound really nice. Um, we have done something similar recently um, where I work for um, a live hinge for a mechanism that just needs to open and close over time. Um, but have you considered doing, let's say, SLS or MJF as well. That is a great suggestion, and we are on the same page. I have from the Chicago IMTS conference a sample part that they SLS printed in TPU, and you can, can't even see the layers. Like, it's gorgeous. Um, it was used to print something similar to a bellow, and the idea is to use that process or something of similar to create origami. The problem is I don't have direct access to that, and it's kind of expensive, so working my way to do testing like that. So great suggestion. We're on the same page. Have you looked into working in any actuation into your designs? Yes. So the paper versions that I made at the very beginning of this journey use like cable driven actuation. So that's something I'd like to explore. A lot of these designs could be leveraged as 4D printing if you use the right filaments in it. So if you use like a UV sensitive or a heat sensitive filament, what you can do is print your hinges using those filaments and then apply that external energy source and it would be actuated whether it be by heat or by voltage. So once I've kind of dialed in the pro like the manufacturing process, the next step is to actuate it either via cable or to leverage it to 4D printing, considering how complex some of the geometries can be. I promise I don't bite. There's no other questions. Hi, uh, my name is Carl from the UK. Uh, you mentioned the J850. Have you done any trials on that yet? I haven't done any trials, but there was a, I think it was an SAE conference in the States about EVs, and there was a Stratasys booth there, and I saw their samples. Essentially, it's a material jetting on fabric, and they cure it with UV light, and you're able to do up to seven different materials on fabric. So. I have yet to do any tests more in terms of like an access standpoint. I don't have access to that machine, okay. but I think we, it would be We have great. a machine, so... Uh, you do? Yeah. So, yeah, let's get in touch afterwards. I and we've got that. a TPU uh, oh, SLS I'm, as well. So. I'm really glad I put that on the side. I was almost not going to. <laughs> Looking at that slide with different processes, there's a company called Hyrel 3D that has a multi-tool. And so they have thermoplastic filament extrusion, they have syringe dispensing with laser UV cured materials, they have laser cutting, so you, you can get a whole bunch of different tools within the same machine that might be interesting to play with as well. I agree, you said Hyrel? Yeah, H-Y-R-E-L, -H Hyrel okay. 3D. Thank you. Yep. Also I have I think 18 business cards if anyone would like a origami card, um, first come first serve. Okay. All right, thank you, Dora. Thank you.